Okay. All of that now uh, taken care of, we can go to, oops, all of that now taken care of, we can go to uh, the content of the course. And we're starting off, I think it's, it's appropriate, especially with this kind of new technology stuff showing up, uh, to start off with a speaker who was there long before most people saw there was a there there. Um, that is the work that uh, Randy Farmer and Chip Morningstar, his, his partner, have been doing for many years has had the assumption that you're going to have a world that's linked by networks and that does what they do, do their business on the network. Uh, and that was long before the internet was a buzzword and long before the web was even thought, well, I probably thought of, but before anybody but a few physicists knew about it. Uh, they developed some early systems for commerce on the net, for people to have graphical person-to-person uh, -person interactions on, the, on a computer network. Um, and I think that uh, it'd be interesting to hear. We haven't chatted about this. How uh, how it looks to sort of see the whole world suddenly grabbing hold of stuff that uh, that Randy and his colleagues have been doing for many years. So, All right, thank you. Oh, you got me. I got one. Is it, uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I'm going to be giving a slide presentation. So, uh, lights and slides, please. Slide. Oh, okay. There we go. Now I can't see any of the buttons, of course, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I thank you all very much for coming to hear me today. Uh, even if uh, you do get credit, um, I'm always, uh, I always enjoy an opportunity to talk to people about things that I've learned. I'm here on behalf of Electric Communities. Um, it's a cyberspace research and development firm, uh, currently based in Los Altos, California. Um, and I'm going to talk. Uh, the title of the talk that, that Terry picked, which I thought was great, was From Habitat to the Full Service Network. Um, I've been building technologies to facilitate what we now, what people now call virtual communities for about 20 years. Uh, I started in school when I was very young building a multiplayer Star Trek game using a HP 3000 computer and file locking as a communications primitive. Um, my most recent works are uh, both entertainment and commerce oriented virtual communities, as Terry mentioned. In the late 80s, uh, I'm going to focus on my work since the 80s. Uh, I was the chief client programmer and um, system administrator, or we use the title Oracle. If you hear me where the, use the word Oracle, that's what I mean, uh, for a project called Lucasfilm's Habitat, um, the first uh, commercial graphic virtual community. Later, I was the chief client programmer and co-architect of the American Information Exchange, the first attempt at um, commerce on the net. Um, and I think still uh, more advanced than most of the, the features that are out there now. Uh, and for the last two years, I've been working uh, with Electric Communities on a product we call uh, the Cyberspace Operating System, which, uh, which I'll talk about in the last half of my talk. Um, before that, I spent a year uh, with Electric Communities helping Fujitsu bring uh, Habitat back to the United States. And I'll be surveying all the habitats as part of my talk. Hi, thanks. Um, this is a, uh, is there any way we can get halfway in between on the light? That'd be great. I can live without the light. I'll scoot over. How's that? Is that better? Um, this is a picture of Doug Crockford, uh, the guy who was going to speak with me today, one of the founders of Electric Communities. Uh, he's uh, not available to attend today. Uh, I did want to get a picture of him and mention because um, He's responsible for the bulk of the design of this talk, at least the look of the slides, besides being the uh, uh, CEO and, and chairman of the board. Um, if you laugh at any of the jokes, it's his responsibility. And if, uh, and if you don't laugh at the jokes, it's because uh, I'm not as good a presenter as him. Um, so the first joke. Um, <laughs> you know, get it? OK. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today in the abstract and in the concrete. Uh, let's talk a little bit in the abstract about uh, metaphors. It, it's just a metaphor. It could have been any metaphor. <laughs> or in, and it could have been this one, too. <laughs> um, I think the point made by the slides themselves. <laughs> We have a, a, a kind of nasty criticism of the hype because we've been in it for so long and, and we know what's at the essence, some of the, the things that are at the bottom. I, I hope to address those today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Okay, some meat. Um, we think uh, we've kind of broken down uh, what people think about the evolution of a network. This applies to many technologies, but specifically to the network. There's been three phases of thinking. First is the uh, technology phase, followed by a content-oriented phase. And we're moving into what we call the value phase. A uh, little expansion on each of those. In the technology phase of thinking about this, it's the uh, field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. It's all about the technology. And the concerns of mankind are that small light on the pile of the technological pyramid. Um, in experience, it's more like this. The uh, concerns of man squash the technology, and, and um, it's not about the technology. It is all about the people. Um, then came a phase, which is the content phase. Uh, here's some data highwayman brand content. Um, it, 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 it's distinguished by the idea that um, people have a pent-up demand for content, and uh, that all they need is the technology, of course, to deliver it. Um, but what uh, multimedia companies are folding left and right because of this idea. Where I don't know if you've heard the phrase shovelware comes to mind, which is, oh, I've got bits. If I just cram them onto a CD-ROM, then I've got something. Um, that's not true. People are interested in value. This assumes people will gladly p pay for things they find to be of value and participate in things that they find to be of value. And that successful systems will contain mechanisms which will encourage the creation of valuable things. And as an example of value, of building systems that provide value to people, I'm going to talk about the habitats. And I personally am probably the person who knows the most about these systems overall. I've been kind of father to all of them in one form or another. Um, so what is a habitat anyway? It's a multi-user virtual online environment, a make-believe world that people enter through home computers connected via telephone lines and networks to a centralized host or bank of hosts at a commercial online service. Today I'll dust off the storybook and tell you about some of the people and events from these habitats, especially the ones I know best, Club Carib and Fujitsu Habitat. I'll talk about how we applied the lessons that the people there taught me in those environments to worlds away and as we go forward into the future. So first was Club Carib. Uh, or also known as Lucasfilm's Habitat. I should preface my comments about my worlds and these worlds with an explanation that of my personal methodology. I learn more from my failures than from my successes. So I'm going to concentrate on some illuminating failures and problems that I've encountered in, these bu in building and, and managing these worlds. Uh, like I said, the first one was Lucasfilm's Habitat. Uh, it was beta tested for 18 months in 1980, 1984, or, I'm sorry, 1980 to 1988. There's a split over there. Uh, it was released under the name Club Carib on a service called Quantum Link, which was co for Commodore 64 only computers. This is back in the days when home computers didn't even have operating systems. You had to reboot them into stiff floppy disk and load the program, and you're going to use them when you were done, turn the computer back off. Um, this is, and it was released in 1988. Quantum Link, uh, you might know now as the world's most popular online service, America Online. Uh, they eventually abandoned their Commodore 64 support. And, um, <laughs> uh, when they abandoned the support, they never moved this technology to the new platform. So America Online gets credit for helping us start it out, but not following through. All right, I'm going to talk, I'm going to give you some terminology that I'll be using. Uh, makes the stories go much quicker, introduce you to the screen. Um, this is the Commerce 64 screenshot from Club Carib. The shot was taken in 1988. The figures in the front are called avatars. I used to have to tell people that. Um, and represent the characters controlled by human beings somewhere out on the net. In the, no uh, the novel Snow Crash notwithstanding, Chip Morningstar coined the term avatar in this usage in 1985. If you haven't read Snow Crash, by the way, you should. Um, it actually contains a lot of clues. And, and when I read it and contacted Neil Stevenson, he was surprised to learn that over half of the features of cyberspace he had dreamed of had already been implemented. Um, the avatars here are standing in a, place of, uh, a piece of the world we call a region. Everything you see is a separate object in the region. It can be interacted with through a point and click style interface. The wall, the signs, the avatars, the ground, the bottle of water up in the corner over here, um, everything is an object. You talk by typing into the little white line at the bottom of the screen, and the words 
appear in word balloons over your head. You'll see that in other slides. I wanted to point out one other thing on this slide, the uh, graffiti up on the wall that says geeks rule. Um, one of the things I learned over the years is that um, that's far too true. Um, this, and this can cause problems, which I'll address in a moment. Uh, of course, I was the king geek ruling over that world. Um, all right, I'm going to talk a little bit about those problems I told you about. When we worked on the original Habitat was done by uh, Chip Morningstar, myself, and some other games designer at Lucas, games designers at Lucasfilm Games, and we had a lot of experience building computer games. We knew exactly the kind of things you do. And in the case of this, it seemed inherent to us that it was like a fantasy role-playing game. Uh, very simple. Uh, everyone knows about that. Um, you, you kill the monsters, you know, or grab the treasure, or defeat the evil wizard, stop the plot to take over the land of Fubar. Um, the constraints on computer games have it such that you always know what the guy is going to do next. You don't know whether he's going to win this combat or this particular round. But you do know that the actions will take place in a certain sequence and, and never jump out of sequence. He'll never go to the end of the game and then to the middle of the game and the front of the game. It turns out in distributed worlds, in, in, in online worlds, that's not true at all. Everyone's acting autonomously. It's completely diverse. Um, we designed all kinds of mechanisms. We, we thought we knew what we were doing. We, you know, we'd set up for our treasure hunts. We could set up things so people could have businesses. We would allow people to run a local newspaper in the world. Uh, they could hang, of course, and they could hang out with their friends and converse and, and interact with each other socially. Um, so we built our tools, like you do for all software projects. You build your support tools, and you build your game design, you create everything. I had um, a bunch of role-playing experience. So I was chosen to create the first adventure. And I created one called the Denalzi Island Adventure. It took me two and a half weeks to create full time, day and night, uh, including 100 regions, like this one. Um, I created puzzles. I uh, wrote little books to put in the world to leave hints around. I took out ads in the local newspaper that was inside the world. I also wrote scripts and hired virtual actors to act out the opening scenes of the adventure. Um, it was a quest to discover a, a stolen amulet. Um, I, I had guessed that it would run several weeks, uh, and it was meant to run during the beta test, which at that time had 60 people as active participants. Uh, the, the day for the quest came, it lasted uh, eight hours. The critical clue was discovered in 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, this meant most of the people uh, never even got to play or even to try to participate as there's a three hour times difference between the East Coast and the West Coast. <laughs> and uh, when people came on at 9 o'clock at night on the West Coast, the game was long over. Um, like I said, I like to concentrate on my failures. Uh, this is one of a, of a pattern that we discovered that the more you planned in, in the forms of activities, the more you made assumptions about people's behavior, um, you had completely unexpected outcomes or they were outright failures. Um, so you create a world, work real hard, try to make it be the best you can be, and it goes nuts and, and leaves without you. Uh, it was very frustrating. The more we tried to control, the less we were in control. Uh, like the famous quote, in the most carefully constructed experiment, under the most carefully controlled circumstances, the organism will do whatever it damn well pleases. Um, so we changed. We woke up one day and, and, and realized that uh, we were bucking against the trend, that what was going on is people were wanting to create their own value in the space, and that our job was to make sure that they got what they needed and what they wanted. Uh, it turns out that giving up control is the way to get the most control, because now you're involved in the processes um, and can influence the direction that things move. By far, the most popular customer activity in all of these worlds is community building. Not just socializing, but defining the very social norms by which avatars and people interact. An example of this, when we built the original Habitat, we had a founding principle, which was conflict is the essence of drama. And so we put guns and magic, and we allowed thievery. People could take things out of each other's hands. Uh, we were testing the idea that materially affecting others would have a much richer effect in the environment. And, and boy, we found out that was true. Um, so I'll give you a quick story about that. 
uh, a mechanism from the original habitat. You could, since we had weapons, something had to happen when you were shot. You would get, sh you could be, you had hit points, and a weapon would do so much damage, like a regular game. Uh, typically, what it meant was you could shoot someone ten times before they died. Um, when you shot, when someone died, what would happen is their contents of their avatar's pocket, the stuff they were carrying, would be destroyed, taken out of the universe. What was holding in your hands would be dropped on the ground. Idea was that the, whatever you were holding was the bounty for being shot. Um, you get a free teleport ride back to your avatar's turf, its personal home, and your head would be handed to you in your hands. <laughs> um, certainly a setback. Certainly, uh, you know, significant uh, effect. You, lo you lose some objects. Uh, typically, the only objects you'd lose in a gunfight would be a gun, because both of you were holding guns and you were doing it for fun. Um, but because it was perceived, the graphics looked like a weapon, looked like a gun in this case, the community took to calling it murder. So a discussion started amongst the community. Was it murder? Uh, if it was murder, uh, what should we do about it? They had a debate, included in these bars and socialization uh, in outside areas, in, in, in uh, bulletin boards. Um, when we designed this world, we tried to do a minimum number of, of rules and made the constraints very loose. They asked, the, the players asked these questions of themselves. Is an avatar an extension of a human being? If so, does it have rights? Even if it doesn't, do we want it to? Or is it a Pac-Man-like critter destined to die a thousand deaths? Or is it something completely different? Is habitat murder a crime? Should weapons be banned? That's certainly technologically doable. Or is it all just a game? I thought this was an interesting debate, but it got more interesting when a guy took to randomly shooting people to make a point. <laughs> <laughs> the odd thing was, in being in control of the world, uh, I could have at any time stopped and made a value judgment. I, lucky enough, I chose not to because uh, in another case where this occurred, um, uh, a system admitter made, made a value judgment and lost a large number of customers. Not because they made a different discussion, different decision than the customers might have made themselves, but because the customers didn't get to decide. Um, so we did have a referendum in this case on whether or not uh, habitat shooting was death and crime. Um, and the referendum came back 50% yes, 50% no. <laughs> um, we had a compromise space, which is, which is one we've been exploring uh, on through the years now, is, well, it's possible to have a world which is both. In the, our case, we just defined the city limits, the parts that look like a town, um, for weapons to not function. You can carry them in there, and when you try to use them, it just says this is a weapon-free zone. It doesn't work. When you exit town, you pass through a, an area where there's a sign that says entering uh, the wildlands. Anything goes. So people could choose by virtual geography which way they wanted to go. Um, it didn't stop them. Uh, they formed one, a, a Greek Orthodox priest in real life formed a, a peace cult and took over a building in town. Uh, they swore off everything having to do with weapons uh, and would intentionally try to grab, uh, if they went out of town, they'd try to steal the weapons and then sell them. Um, what was happening is the, there was, starts to become some disharmony, some leakage, uh, where people now have a world where they can do what they want, but they're used to living in a world where things are provided for them, where law and justice are given. Um, in order to emulate this, they decided to elect a sheriff. They ran a bunch of candidates. We rigged up a voting booth. We're now in facilitate mode, so we're just doing whatever they say. Um, they had a debate, uh, including a major scandal, um, <laughs> which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, and eventually, through the whole process, they ended up with a sheriff. Of course, now they had a guy, he had a fancy badge and a hat. And guess what? <laughs> what authority? Uh, so, so begins the next debate. Um, what are the powers of a government if you're going to select one for yourself? What are the benefits? What about a justice system? What about lawyers? 
And what would jail and punishment be anywhere in a service where people are paying to participate in your community? Um, here's, the, here's the downside. Um, we had to shut down the Habitat beta test before we got an answer to those questions. And when Club Carib came back up, Quantum Link was on the uh, afraid side. Uh, and they took all weapons, all magic, all semblance of any conflict out of their service when, when they shipped, for, shipped Club Carib. Uh, and the sequels since, the Fujitsu Habitat and Worlds Away, neither of them currently embody anything having to do with personal conflict. Um, so these questions are open. Uh, I would point also to MUDs and MOOs, where some of these issues are being hashed out even today. Uh, so long, long story. Um, I'm trying to pull this back to the idea that when you build these virtual spaces, they don't necessarily come with default rules or governments. But when they're constructing, when they're self-constructing these spaces, you need to be aware that there are not only uh, statists, but anarchists in these spaces. Uh, I'll move on to Fujitsu Habitat now. This is a, uh, Fujitsu licensed Lucasfilm's technology in 1988 and released it on uh, a, a uh, multimedia platform called the FM Towns in 1990. Um, this is the world map for Fujitsu Habitat. It shipped with the very first version and has served as a straitjacket on their world design since. Um, only the center downtown area, below the red light, the red thing there, um, and a maze were ready at the release of the product. And they've pretty much followed the map as for expansion since. It's amazing how something as simple as a marketing-oriented map can serve as a straitjacket to hamper growth. Because now, of course, they can't extend the world in, in the ways I've been talking about without having to release a new map. <laughs> this is the red shirt troop I'd like to introduce you to. Um, they're in Fujitsu Habitat. They are performing arcs group. You can see they've painted their bodies all red. The things they're holding in their hands are little red spray paint cans. Uh, and they all changed their heads to match, in, in effect completely obscuring their identities to look identical. Um, that, that, that one person on the end, she hasn't changed her head yet. But, um, the forming ARP troops have formed spontaneously in all three versions of the habitats. In Club Carib, they were called wave teams. And they performed coordinated movements and gesturing and drawing, putting text in word balloons. Avatars could wave and they could jump and they could stick their hands out and bend over and do some limited gestures. Well, it turns out the people in, in uh, Club Carib invented this wave team technique where they figured out somehow to coordinate their activities so they look like they're doing kind of a, kind of a uh, cheerleading show. Well, kind of on Valium, maybe. <laughs> of course, it was 300 baud those days, but I recently saw one in Worlds Away. And it looks pretty much the same. Um, what's interesting is these teams had uh, regular scheduled practices and participated in monthly competitions judged by their follow, fellow citizens. The hot teams are so hard to get in, if you miss a tr practice, you're out. Um, the key point, all of this happens without any external support. People will find the space to create communities to cooperate and add value for themselves. A little talk about economics, which is necessary. Um, all the machines in the habitat, all, all the habitats have, have an in internal economy uh, based on a unit called the token. Uh, you get a certain number of them for connecting or accruing online time, depends upon the service. Uh, they often are prizes uh, given out in treasure hunts or uh, even by fellow avatars who are trying to, to make their rich, their universe more rich. In the worlds away, they run a lot, uh, one guy runs a lottery, he collects tokens and every week announces winners and, and gives out 75% of the tokens. Um, but the official economy is supported by machines. And this machine is a, is a, a Vendroid. Since we work for George Lucas, we got to use the droid thing. Um, avatars buy all sorts of objects from the Vendroids, including uh, body paints, and different styles of heads. And in Worlds Away, you can actually change your uh, body style to one of seven body styles. Um, there are also pawn machines that buy the items back. So one of the things you get in a world that's object-oriented and everything has a value is no litter. Because as you're walking along and if someone left it on the ground, you pick it up and the next time you go buy a pawn machine, you turn it back into cash. Um, there are machines for publishing, 
teleportation and body and gender changing depending upon which service you're in. Of course, if there are any bugs in a machinery of economy, of economy it can have some interesting effects. During the alpha test, uh, I remember I mentioned the sheriff was in a uh, candidate was involved in a scandal. Well, here's the scandal. Um, one of the sheriff candidates and a couple other people had discovered that some of the vending machines were selling items uh, for l less than they would be pawned for at a pawn machine across town. <laughs> this is a money machine. It turns out uh, the dolls were dolls were selling for 75 tokens and pawning for 100, and crystal balls were were selling for 18,000 token, tokens and pawning for 30,000. Now, that's a lot of tokens. No, we never even expected anyone to ever be able to afford a crystal ball, much less get into a scam. But they bought boxes, ran across town, filled up their boxes with dolls, ran across town, sold them, <laughs> ran across town. All the way to they got 18,000 tokens. Ooh, then they bought a crystal ball. <laughs> all right, I'm the system operator. I come in one morning, and I, I, I generate all the stuff that tells me what's going on in the world. I have a report I call the T1, the token report. <laughs> it's multiplied by five overnight. <laughs> and and you know, the economy has just drastically devalued. <laughs> what happened? Uh, I find out what happened. Uh, I just look to see who's the richest avatars, and there's these three new people who own more wealth than existed in the, than the, in the world the day before. Um, um, some interesting effects of that. Um, one is, can I take it back? Which I didn't. Um, the other is, when I reported, I said, well, well, what's going on? Why didn't you report this as a bug? They said, I got it fair and square. <laughs> um, so people's perceptions about what, what's going on is something you have to pay close attention to. There's a similar bug, um, though not as industrious. In that case, uh, we generated a whole bunch of hours. Three people, you know, paid us like probably about two, you know, one hundred and fifty dollars to do that. <laughs> um, so <laughs> all night, um, and 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 then they took those tokens. Those they cared so much. The point is, they cared so much. They took those tokens and turned around and put them back into the economy and made it a richer world. Um, in the Fujitsu habitat, a similar bug occurred. The teleport booth takes two tokens, um, and by nature, it's possible to be holding one token. You put it in the machine. One minus two is minus one is 65,535 change. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to tell you those stories because, because it's funny now. Uh, it's not funny when it's US dollars. Um, a little more on economies. There's the fictional economy of tokens, and there's US dollars. But then there's the real economies. What you see here is a Fujitsu Habitat head party. It, hang on. I lost my clip. The, um, when you get hyperinflation, when you get, especially when you get bugs like that, people tend to get fat bank accounts. And those who stay on anyway, who are active, even if they don't do anything special, become um, rather wealthy. After a while, you've bought everything you want to buy. Well, it turns out in every habitat so far, no matter how hard we try, the real underground economy ends up becoming unique heads. Um, this is a head party. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a good slide. This is a snake head behind the chair over there. Um, expression is everything. People want to be identified. They want to be identified uniquely. They want it, people to know who they are. So the value of heads that aren't coming from vending machines, that you can't just buy if you stay on long enough, or you can't just buy if you win a contest or something, um, are two orders of magnitude higher than the rest, and potentially more. I haven't followed any of these long enough to see if they'll go beyond that. Um, one of the ways, so one of the things you always have to look at is what are the real economies? What do people really value? And, w and focus your attention on that. And worlds the way we did when we focused more on how to get more extensibility and more expressiveness and more flexibility out of the heads. So on to Worlds Away. Uh, in 1933, Fujitsu contracted electric communities to write a business plan to bring Habitat back to the United States. 1993, I'm sorry. <laughs> I wrote it right. I'm just saying it wrong. Um, uh, Fujitsu had successfully uh, got the system running, but they realized the people were in, in the United States were jumping on 
getting on networks and doing real things. The Japanese were behind, and they ne needed their technology upgraded. They wanted the guys who built the original one to help them whip something into shape to take them into the cable age. Um, so we wrote a business plan for them, and I supervised the production of Worlds Away, which is available on CompuServe. You can see a menu that looks just like this by typing go away on CompuServe. <laughs> um, CompuServe was very interested in it because they're trying to shed their old mobile like image, end quote. Um, it integrates not World Away integrates not only the improvements in, in computer technology, we now have like things like operating systems and display standards and all these other wonderful things that make it possible to write this stuff, um, but it includes the lessons we learned in interface and world divide and design and management. Um, as some of the stories I've told today illustrate, self-expression is the key element in providing a compelling environment for humans to interact in. And in this slide, you'll see that we've increased the range of customization. We allow more human and non-human like skin tones, um, more detailed clothing and accessories. Although I've got to tell a little side trip here. Uh, you'll notice the resolution on these avatars is fairly detailed. There's black outlines around the shirts and if you can't see it back there. Um, one of the things I was absolutely convinced of is that the you wouldn't be able to get naked. That's um, one of the questions people often ask is, you know, can your avatar get naked? And we went, well, as the resolution goes up, the answer is no. It was easier when the avatars were those flat things you saw at the beginning. You could just paint them all pink, and if you wanted to call that a pink outfit, fine. You want to call it naked, fine. Um, but I was convinced this wasn't going to happen. And the other day, I visited a web page. If you follow our web pages through the links to some of the other people, um, I found a web page where someone was doing a fan dance with a large fern. Um, it turns out that you can go ahead and paint your avatar any color you want, so you can pick a flesh tone if you like. And if you hold a fern in front of you, it, it's it's the um, who's the, who's the bubble dancer? I forget the name now. Yeah, Sally Rand. Sally Rand. <laughs> it's the Sal the Sally Rand effect. Um, it, the po the point of the story the point of the story is it, it is not that I'm a lech, but that people will find ways to do what they want to do regardless of what you think the technology will produce. Um, they wanted to express themselves that way, and there was a contest, and everyone was completely surprised. Um, also, here are some things that are subtle that aren't clear. Uh, we've added m balloon styles, so you can have thought balloons, so you can speak in the second person about a conversation you're in, but everyone can overhear you. This comes from the traditions of moos and muds, which are things that I follow and, and have, uh, have taken several lessons from as well. Um, the heads now will have a full range of e facial expressions. Um, and between gestures and expressions can now be entered into the text. So when you enter a smiley, your avatar smiles. When you enter a frown, your avatar frowns. Uh, you can enter a jump so that w as the text is displayed, the, um, the gestures are go with it. And people have been experimenting with that extensively. Some people have been doing new dances. Okay, I know it was a long trip on the, uh, on the avatars and worlds away. I want to get to the operating system stuff, so let's teleport out of here. Um, a little bit about terminology. Cyber means crap. Um, now, at the same time, we use the term cyberspace because although it means crap, it's the best term we've got. Um, I'll, I'll put a pull out for something that's not a broken, uh, a call out for that something that's not a broken metaphor that might mean uh, something a little more meaningful than cyber something. Okay. I'm going to find a way to clip this back on because I want to. My hands are all slimy. Okay. What we learned in building not just the habitats but amics is that in the next world the ru rules are different. That it's not about building software to connect people to computers. It's about building a system that gets out of the way and finds a way to augment human-to-human -human communications. Because the target market is the whole thing, baby. We're looking at an emerging mass medium revealing itself. Um, it's a medium based on persistent places, computer-moderated persistent places. It's a new kind of communications paradigm. Uh, I use the paradigm more, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> It's different than telephone. It's different than anything else. And it has some very dynamic properties. We'll talk about those. Um, 
what we're working on is a mass medium. If you mess up, you get a niche, a novelty, or worse. So it's important to know what the attributes are. How do you determine what the attributes are? Is it by looking for the killer app? Oh, like this one, maybe? It sure caused a lot of smoke, and everyone knows, you know, where there's smoke, there is fire. No, where there's smoke, there's guys blowing smoke. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are the attributes? How do you build an infrastructure? What, is, what do you need to make it possible for humans to interact with each other in these new spaces? I'm going to go over eight requirements. First, I'll go through a set of eight requirements, and then I'll talk about how the cyberspace operating system meets those requirements. Um, first, that it be scalable. The technology and institutional components should be sufficient for a system to scale for a system that covers every human and every computer in the world. And that's not just today's humans and computers. What do we mean by scalable? Well, sometimes when you talk about buying server solutions to things, what they mean when they talk about scalable is, well, here's an ant. And this is what they mean by a scaled ant. Um, of course, if you scale an ant this big, it dies. Uh, the way you scale ants is by doing this. Um, oh, scalability is sufficiently important. I'm going to take a little bit of a tr side trip and talk about it, about what we mean by scalable, because different people mean different things. Um, let's look at a couple of systems, a couple of technological systems, and, and, and their scale curves. Uh, this is the telephone system. Uh, the axes along the bottom are adoption from zero to oh, 5 billion. And the benefit is an arbitrary scale of you know, how good it is. And uh, hopefully my explanations will fill in the axes. The telephone has scaled remarkably well. As more people subscribe, the system becomes more valuable because the set of people you can communicate with increases. Whenever, when everyone has a phone, though, the likelihood that you'll be able to connect to a person goes down slightly because they might actually be on the phone talking to someone else, uh, or they might be somewhere else. Answering machines and fax machines have helped keep the benefit of the system high, even at the largest scale. So it, it, does, it flattens off, but it doesn't dive. Phone system does scale. Looking at automobiles, on the other hand, uh, when there were a few cars, um, you couldn't get very far. There weren't any roads, and it was hard to get gas. Um, you didn't have business infrastructure for accidents, insurance. As roads improved and service stations came, value of cars went up, more people wanted cars, massive changes in the urban and the suburban landscapes. Uh, unfortunately, when everyone gets cars, um, they become mobile blockades. You get traffic jams, pollution, and those are two of the obvious effects of having too many cars. It's very clear that cars do not scale up. This is a technology graph. Uh, we pick HD TV. You could just as easily pick interactive TV or virtual reality. Um, it, this is a technology which might do very well when it finally gets going, um, but it may never get going. The cost of programming for HD TV is, is very high and can't be sustained, of course, because there aren't that many HD TV sets. It's, this is a classic chicken and egg problem. This is how it looks on the graph. Um, this is an example of something that doesn't scale small. So when thinking about scaling, remember it goes both ways. That is a World Wide Web graph, probably the most controversial slide. Um, it doesn't suffer from the problems of small scale, but it suffers enormously from the problems of large scale. As the number of people surfing the web increases, it becomes more congested and chaotic. As it reaches its limits to growth, it will likely mutate into something that scales slightly better and so wiggle its way up like a snake. I'm actually looking for a slide. There have been some traffic patterns that actually look like that on the web. Um, this here is not a uh, prediction. This is a design requirement. If we're going to try to connect everyone in the world to everyone else or to allow them to connect to each other and provide value and services and, and meaning to each other, um, you have to design a system that can scale like this. OK, back, back to our requirements. Second requirement is that it's open. Uh, in a university setting, this shouldn't be too controversial. And even these days, in the, in the business setting in the last few months, this isn't very controversial either. Um, but it is important to note why it's important that this be open, or, or how, how it is that, that companies will buy off and 
buy into an open standard because these are the orders. This is the order for a company of what kind of standard you want. You'd like your own standard because you can own a lock, but on the net, no lock will live. Even if you look at Netscape and, and Microsoft now battling it out in the HTML extension wars, what's going to happen is it's going to be some subset of both. Um, because that will meet the second requirement. Well, I'd rather have an open standard than my competitor's proprietary standard. Key issue, a higher standard of standardness. Next requirement, that there is no single privileged or technically, or, I'm sorry, no single privileged, technical, or administrative nexus. It must be fully distributed, like the scaling ant. You must, if you Try to put a central place, a central point, whether it be a, a technical, technical is in, ter in terms of a server, or administrative in terms of, let's say, a key, key escrow registry. Um, these become bottlenecks and limit scalability and limit growth. Traversable. Um, this one I should say a lot about, but every time I try to, I fumble. This is moving data and objects between people services and between machines. This is something we really, really need and we really don't have. Um, we have like FTP, but there's nothing, there's no certification, no authority, no way to tell that this thing does what it's going to do. In fact, we've gone the opposite direction when it comes to software. We have huge disclaimers that say this software isn't even guaranteed to be on this disk uh, instead of Th those kind of disclaimers attached to anything else in our lives would, would be rejected. And the reason we've had to do that is, is till now, no one's spent a lot of time saying, no, it's important. We want to get everyone on, on the net. And to do that, we have to make some guarantees. We have to be able to say, have a cyberspace underwriter's laboratory who will certify objects and say that these can work on your machine. The fifth requirement is that it be commercial. Uh, I gave some hints in the habitats. Um, about the power of economic systems and how when they're brought to bear on cyberspace systems, they make a lot of things just work. One of the things that's, uh, I like to point to uh, Usenet Net News unmoderated groups is an example of something that's uh, decayed into to, uh, non-usability. At the last hackers conference, um, people were asked, how many of you still read Net News? two hands went up out of 300 people. And they said, what did you replace them with? And everyone said, mailing lists. People move out of spaces when they stop being providing value. Net news has stopped providing value. And as a result, these, because there's no economic incentive, um, the, the quality of information just disintegrates. So it need a commercial component. We had experience. Significant experience building uh, online commercial service called the American Information Exchange, which we ran in uh, a full test for one year uh, before it was shut down uh, by Autodesk. I'm proud to announce today that Electric Communities has secured the non-exclusive rights to use the American Information Exchange intellectual property and software. Um, so we'll be integrating, if you know anything about that, we'll be integrating their work into our frameworks. That includes uh, not only uh, reputation systems, some of the things on the previous. It includes uh, electronic credential services, reputation services, arbitration services, financial services. It doesn't have digital money in it. We'll have to get that from someone else. Um, and a commercial negotiation framework uh, added to email. All right, I'll move on. Sixth requirement, social. Actually, I think I've covered this quite well. Earlier, it's about people. Um, this is a cute little slide. Um, there's a continuum here. It's not a graphical continuum. It's a continuum of richness of interaction. The seventh requirement, and again, all these requirements are like soup. They need to be mixed in together, is that the system be secure. And what we mean by secure is that it provides protection against fraud and abuse. It's secure for humans. This means humans can use this, and it's you know more secure than using their credit card, that they can trust the interactions. This isn't about what it isn't is what's on this list. Um, it's not about naive optimism, obscurity, firewalls, or even cryptography 
for its own sake. Cryptography is not security. Security is a discipline. Security is something you apply across the board. It, it doesn't matter if your message is encrypted if the person steals the keys from your pocket. You are not secure. Security is more than just putting a lock on the door. And it's portable um, because you never know what kind of equipment you'll be running on. All right, how are we going to tie this together real quick? Cyberspace Operating System is a product that the Electric Communities is working on which integrates all of the principles or, or requirements uh, that I just outlined for you. Um, a way to think about what we're going to be providing is to think of cyberspace as kind of this conceptual plane out reaching to everyone. And if you slice the plane, there's a little software layer called the Cyberspace Operating System, wafer thin. And that soothes and protects you from the scary network architectures underneath so that you don't have to know anything about PPPs and IP stacks and all these other things. You're just on the net. Since networks come in a large variety of configurations, it needs to protect you from that. From that. There is, it is a certainty there will not be a single type of network covering the whole world. The protocols must be portable with respect to networks. And in fact, when reducing a network down to what you care about, it is connectivity and trade-offs between reliability, cost, bandwidth, and latency. Most of the value and most of the money will be in the services which are built on top of the operating system. The marketplace of services will be open to everyone in the world. And of course, since the cyberspace I said you had to conceptualize it, um, doesn't actually exist in physical space, you'll need some equipment to access it with. This might take the form of a set-top box, might be one of these new uh, internet access computers. Uh, regardless of the equipment, they should interoperate. Now the cyberspace operating system glues them together so that the services can be provided on whatever network architecture is available and delivered through whatever equipment is available. I should note what it's not, what the cyberspace operating system is not, is not an interface, it's not a metaphor or a set of metaphors, and it's not any particular content. Those are areas of competitive advantage. That's what people have to offer to each other. Uh, we're not in that business. Uh, we will provide services as ex examples on top of that. but. Um, the cyberspace operating system itself is an API for cyberspace. There are the ingredients again. Okay, down to the business part of the stuff. I'm here to announce today um, the e-programming language, which is our first step on the road to the cyberspace operating system. The information available was released today on our webpage, which I'll give you again at the end. We're taking Java. We're adding communications, optimistic computation. I'm, I'm forgetting the third one on there. Anyway, there's a list of features. Um, we're making it possible for objects to live, Java objects to live on your machine securely and talk to other Java objects. So we're setting up dynamically, dynamic peer-to-peer -peer or client-server applications. These are not just Java applets. A lot of people think of Java as an applet language because that's all the examples they've seen. Um, we ch fundamentally changed the security model so that objects communicate with each other through capability semantics, the ability to send messages from object to object across the network. Uh, there's a white paper describing this on our webpage. I won't go into technical details here unless people want to talk about it, but I'm not the technical lead on this, so. Um, that is the first step on the road to the cyberspace operating system, which we're hoping to have late in 1996. Uh, and again, we're working in open standards area. We'll be publishing the specifications for the cyberspace protocols and the cyberspace operating system in the public domain. We'll be selling reference implementations, but we'll also uh, be launching services. We're hiring. This is a de facto company logo. Um, 
Electric Communities is leading the open systems efforts to design and implement global cyberspace infrastructure derived from the principles of decentralization, security, and community. We've already identified the primary components of the protocols, completed the specifications, and are started implementation starting with E. We're actively promoting our effort, searching for partners, contributors, and fellow travelers. Thank you very much. I, I'll answer questions. And looks like I have half hour for questions. Hi. So it wasn't clear to me whether the cyberspace operating system deals with the level of, of that's more closer to the habitat level, where you've got no. avatars or objects. And no. The cyberspace operating system will include a foundational. A fa there are three layers: the foundation, a ground floor, and superstructure. That's what we call them. Foundation is basically E and things associated with it, getting communications between distributed objects. On top of that, our ground floor has a, a traversable object model, which is of our own design, derived from the work we've done in building these other systems, where um, it, then objects can move by themselves and have some sense of, of what they are and can be carried by people from place to place. And the protocols associated with authorizing moving a piece of running code from one place to another. Um, and on top of that, once you have that, the ability to build those objects, we will build sets of objects based on our experience, including financial frameworks and social frameworks, out of those objects. And that will be part of the bundle that a, a cyberspace operating system comes with. We'll distribute um, the equivalent of a client application. I won't call it a browser because its browser is too limited. Browser is a reading thing. In the future, we think these applications will be uh, it, b both clients and servers. There's some terminology discussion going on about what they'll be called. Um, so you might be looking at something else, but part of your presence is in your client and serving the requests of another one. And, and these could be arbitrarily connected through space. So um, we'll be distributing, we'll be uh, producing clients and, and especially heavyweight classes and servers as well. Because for all my distributa, there's still at some level you still run a piece of code in your machine, and so you'll always be trying to get the bigger machines you want and as much power out of the space you're in. Yeah. The scandal that you were talking about in regards to, okay. to the sheriff, was that, um, did the community at large feel that what the three people had done was um, unethical? Or uh, no, they elected the guy, even though they knew about the scam. <laughs> uh, I think they elected him because of the scam. I think they, they thought he cared and really understood what was going on better than the other people. To a certain extent, couldn't you just argue that the the system didn't efficiently pass along information, so there was inefficiencies, in which case one part was actually paying more than someone else was selling it for? I mean, that's that would in this real world that would be basically economics by low sell. Oh yeah, but this was a bug. I mean, uh, it was someone didn't put. Um, there were some default values, and someone changed the default over here and not over there. I mean, uh, if that doesn't happen in Worlds Away, I, ch I, I, I knew this was a problem. So in Worlds Away, every item knows its sale price. When it's sold out of the machine, it gets stamped with how much it was sold for on the server. And the pawn machine, it doesn't have any prices for any items. It has a, a margin. And it buys back minus margin. So um, the way to scam that is to have someone change the object on the server. And that, that's too hard. Um, the security issues about that are interesting, though. Um, and I don't think I made that clear in my talk. Is that security, the, the, the fifth ingredient, security, or seventh ingredient, um, when you move into a fully distributed peer-to-peer -peer system, that's a big deal. Because in, in all the versions of Habitats, and even Amex, um, there was a centralized server. It was protected, in a sense protected. It had a physical location to go after it. If we didn't provide protocols to access the data remotely, you, you could go into the machine and lift the disk pack. Um, in a distributed system, you have to look at that again. You can't count on it. And on Worlds Away, I said the items are stamped on the server with the price they were sold for. Um, a distributed system, that can't be the case. You have to have other mechanisms. So it's a, it's a significant issue for, for arbitrarily, um, arbitrary relationship systems, whether peer-to-peer, -peer, client server, and all the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that Sun is giving away Java and assuming that they'll make money by generating enough volume that well, they'll sell no, more Sun servers, there are, right? They're licensing.
Java. Okay. There, you, you can use it for personal use. I happen to know this because we're doing something built on Java. Um, you can use it for personal use, but you can't use their uh, environment for commercial use without a license. The, the second part of this question was um, in terms of electric communities. Mm -hmm. Are end users going to have any awareness of whether they're using your software? Will they? I hope not. And so it's only going to be servers that will be buying the software, and it'll be interoperable well, with? Uh, it depends on the software. I was talking about when I said I hope not. I hope the operating system becomes ubiquitous. I would like it to be uh, the business stream. Does ubiquitous mean given away? That's the uh, Yeah, we'll be giving away reference implementations. Um, of the operating system, but there's added value stuff. People will be adding their own um, object classes on top, which give it special capabilities. So this one's really good for doing, um, you know, commercial-oriented transactions in large-scale military databases or something. Um, the it's 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 a middleware business, and everyone knows middleware is a challenging business. Um, we're not only selling those; we'll sell reference implementations. Uh, our, our intention is to wh whoever makes the boxes that people use to connect to the net ubiquitously, the cheap boxes, whatever they are someday, um, that they be running uh, our implementation of that software. It's not necessary. Uh, a, a good example uh, of the business model is uh, PostScript and Adobe. Uh, PostScript is a, a widely available standard. You could go out and write one and sell PostScript interpreters, uh, but most printers that have PostScript interpreters have Adobe's. Um, for the same kinds of reasons, uh, we like to be the uh, the recognized brand for cyberspace operating system. We have to prove ourselves to do that, of course. Um, I, I like looking at JVC, who still collects a royalty on every video cassette sold in the United States because they have the letters VHS on them. So branding's another business. So there is business in cyberspace of the serious caliber. Oh, here. Um, have you been following the VRML debate? And if so, what do you think we're doing right, and what do you think we're doing wrong? Oh gosh, you ask a loaded guy. I was, I, I'm quote, I have a quote in the latest Wired in which I compare uh, 3D to blue. Um, uh, do you know that? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Can I think about that? I will answer that question. I'd like to think about how I want to answer that question in a public forum. Can you just repeat your quote for those huh? who didn't read it? Can I'm you repeat your quote for those of us didn't, who didn't read it? Um, all right, I'll try to repeat it. The piece is in ID Fortes. I'm pronouncing it wrong because I don't know French. Um, titled, Coming to You in 3D. I'll try to get it right. 3D isn't a user interface. 3D isn't the missing ingredient. 3D isn't even very good yet. Um, what 3D is an, is an attribute, like the color blue. So the next time someone tells you that uh, 3D is changing the universe forever, or if it isn't 3D, it isn't worth anything, substitute the word blue for 3D. Now, I understand that I'm getting a response in the next article, so <laughs> you guys can follow the debate there. Um, I actually like 3D systems. What I don't like is anything that puts 3D at the beginning of the sentence. Um, I, I really think it's about people interacting, and anything that doesn't start there is a problem. And I've spent a lot of time talking to the VRML founders or Cabal or whatever they are. Um, and they've been very receptive and listening. That's why I don't want to be too critical. Uh, I must say, I, I, I laughed for 10 minutes the first time I ever heard of the virtual reality markup language. Um, the, you know, I, I thought VR was a bad enough oxymoron without adding markup language to the idea that there's a reality and a markup language together. <laughs> At least they changed it to modeling eventually. Uh, they did, yeah. I, we talked to Mark when, when he changed it. Went, oh, that's an improvement. Um, I, I worry about gluing things together. I, I mean, the reason we go out and do this talk is, is there's, you can glue stuff together and reach a dead end. And it can look cool and, and get a lot of press. Uh, you haven't seen EC out garnering huge amounts of hype. We're trying to build something that really works. And we're only going to use as much hype as necessary to get the money to build it, and that's it. Because it's going to float or stand on its own. It's going to sink or stand on its own. Um, we have, uh, in terms of virtual communities, uh, the, f the founders of electric communities have the only successful revenue generating businesses, we got a track record of building these things. We really think we know what the issues are. Presentation is an issue, but it is not the central issue. 
in our, in our thinking. Some people think it's a central issue, and I welcome them. I, I think the challenge, actually, I'll throw it out as a challenge. I think it's a challenge in 3D interfaces is to decouple navigation from presentation. I think it's just nuts that you know, all, of the, all of the throughput is in terms of navigating around a 3D space when that's not what we spend our lives doing. When we interact, we're not navigating. We're doing the functions. You know, what, what are the meanings in interface? I, I, I didn't come here to do an inter UI design. But um, that's the challenge I'd like to solve if I had plenty of time uh, decoupling navigation from presentation. Go ahead. Um, Pavel Curtis, Curtis gave a talk about Fable, and I was wondering if there's any connection. Fabric? Fabric. Fabric yeah. and Fable. And, uh, um, are you connected to that? Are you using any of their technology? Is their uh, technology competitive with yours? I don't uh, really understand. Um, that's because Pavel doesn't make it clear. Um, we re meet regularly with Pavel. Pavel's were co-researchers, as she knows. She's just one of Pavel's <laughs> folks. That's fine. No, that's fine. Um, Pavel's a good friend. Um, and we'll know soon. I, I, I'm sure you'll, you all will hear because uh, Xerox is doing some kind of reorientation, which I know nothing about, and Pavel's been holding us off for two months. Um, and if they don't do the right thing, I'm hiring him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a more basic question. I, somehow I missed um, what you envision as the relationship down the road once you launch the operating system. What's the relationship between this system and something like AOL or eWorld or things like oh, that? I, I, I that didn't, that wasn't clear. I, you didn't miss it. I didn't say it. Um, that's an interesting question. There will always be a room. There will always be space for aggregators, those who collect connections for other people by theme. Um, directory service. I mean, Yahoo gives a hint that even on the net, there's there's a business in collecting things, and some of these new indexes that are filtered for you and, and, and can be tested for different things other than just having a URL. You know, quality evaluations. Um, the qu questions for the online services are: Are they in a position to move to a new architecture, or are they tied to old architectures? Without fail, the ones that have been tied to old architectures are bailing like mad. And even some of the ones who tried to come out with proprietary architectures, even MSN, in, you know, a couple weeks after it comes out, reorients to become an internet company. Uh, Prodigy is now down to a million customers and, and failing fast. Um, the, so will they move over? The savvy companies will make it. Uh, of, co of course, the history is that whenever there's a new medium or a significant change in technology, uh, none of the big players survive. They never, they never make it through. Uh, lots of metaphors, railroad, you, you can check it out in history. Uh, the railroad crumbled all the big companies that existed previous to the railroad, and then there were new giants. And then those ones were toppled by the automobile. Um, and uh, maybe we saw the crack of that with Microsoft being downgraded, having their stock downgraded. I don't know. Um, AOL, uh, the people there are smart. I've been working off and on with them for over 10 years. Uh, and there are some really bright people there. Um, and the question is, is how, how much will they be dedicated to their architecture? Uh, they have a 10-year-old protocol, and it really sucks. Um, so, so essentially, services like that will have a choice either to kind of be subsumed by your architecture or maintain their own and perhaps wither and become more of a niche market kind of thing? Sure. Yeah, th 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 that's one thing. It's, it, is we often joke about you know one one net to, to bind them all you know, <laughs> um, but but that one net is completely diverse, um, and so it has architectural hidey holes and corners. I mean in the whole intranet question remains; it doesn't go away. You, you provide uh, the tools to allow everyone to connect to each other, but you don't certainly don't require it. Uh, coming on the tail end of his question, I guess, how, how does uh, your product relate to Netscape and other, you know, uh, robust browsers like that? Uh, well, that depends. Uh, it depends on whose point of view you're asking. I'll tell you ours. Um, we don't see ourselves as, as competitive. We see them as a dynamic company that ad adapts. If they, try to, to, if they try to make HTML the, the communication standard, you know, if they want HTML, 4.6 to be the cyberspace operating system will be competitors because that's a dead end. It's not going to work. Uh, but there are smart people there, um, and they've been adapting technology fast. The, the, to date, their strategy 
has advertised has been to kitchen sink everything. I mean, next releases will have CollaborShare in them. They've got emailers and and no void. I mean, it's it's the kitchen sink approach. Um, ours goes back to the modular software approach in the sense that you know, no, just provide a substrate and let people put the pieces in as they need them. Um, that's not incompatible with the kitchen sink sink approach. Uh, what happens is the kitchen sink gets broken into pieces. So, I, I can't speak for them. Um, we wouldn't mind talking to them. You've kind of sketched out one scenario for us with your company. Would you mind um, articulating a few alternative scenarios? Say this whole thing doesn't come to fruition. What oh, would be some alternative plan scenarios? R. <laughs> plan R. Okay. Um, well, Plan R is pretty h is hinted at. Um, we do have financial investors. Uh, the company's been now funded two rounds and is going on a third. Uh, we expect to complete all our funding this year and therefore we'll be able to complete our work at the end of the year. Um, but we are committed to open standards uh, and always have been since even before getting the company funded, our research has been as much as possible published. And in fact, like I said, we have two papers published today. Um, this will continue both during the life of the company and if something weird were to happen to the company as well. We're committed to making the world safe for cyberspace, uh, allowing people to interact with each other. And if we can keep that from becoming like Bill Gates. Bill Gates said in Fortune magazine last year, uh, he wants a piece of every transaction on the net. And, and Electric Communities is fundamentally opposed to that, including to the point of telling everyone everything we know if we need to, uh, within the limits of intellectual property law. Other questions? I'll, I'll, you've got questions about Habitat. Those are great, too, by the way. When you're creating a virtual community, to a certain extent, you need some sort of infrastructure for people when they come in to have a sense of the world around them. Yet, at the same time, with the Fujitsu model, by laying out the, I guess, the the landscape, basically became a straitjacket, as you said. Yeah. So at what point, like, how much do you, when you're creating new worlds, how much do you build in so there's a starting point and then let the community involve on its own. How can you determine where that starts and ends? Actually, the st it scales down okay. Um, uh, the, the advice there is no more than, a little more than you think and a, and a lot less than, than, or I'm sorry, a little more than you have to and a lot less than you think. Um, the initial Worlds Away world for a CompuServe base, which has four million customers, not that all of them are coming to Worlds Away by any stretch, but um, is a world with probably a couple hundred regions in it. It's very small. Um, it's uh, probably a little too crowded. But when you're going to err, you want to err in the side of too crowded, not too big. I'm going to take a slam at one of my competitors, Alpha World, uh, which is available on the net, by the way, at Worlds Inc. That's a worlds.net, right? www.worlds.net. Uh, where they have a 3D world. This is the way to answer the 3D question. Um, where people are go in and all the avatars look the same. They're all little little 3D stick figure guys with brown heads and brown pants and white shirts. Um, they look exactly the same. Their name floats next to them, and whenever they type, the words float on top of them. And there's this huge world, 10,000 square miles, that they're running around in in 3D. And what you can do there is talk to the other people, and use the panels that they provided to build houses and buildings, and they built some pretty amazing structures. They built a rocket ride that makes your avatar go shooting up in the air and parachute down, and water slides, and, and underwater caverns, all these wonderful creative places in a 10,000 square mile area, which means they almost never see each other. You got a world which people need high powered computers to access, and what they do is they go in and play Legos. Okay, Legos is cool, but Legos is Legos. I mean, you can. Uh, they've got people literally who are advertising these towns that they've built, that are you know, a couple square miles wide. That they've spent hours and hours and days and days building these towns, and they're inviting people to move in. But why? Because they can go build their own town. Um, what's missing there is enough closeness to build a community. There are no mechanisms in the world to create community. All you can do is talk about, come over to my place and see what I built. But you can't even find the person because they didn't spend time building mechanisms for contacting the people online. It's more about the way it looks and what you can make out of that than it is about even knowing there are other people there. Um, 
one of the things that Alpha World's missing, I've discussed this with the designer of Alpha World, is an economy. Uh, having an economy there for a way to, to sort out the wheat from the chaff and people to be able to vote or, 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 or sacrifice real estate. You say, well, your stuff's good. It should be closer to where everyone comes in and my stuff will be further out. Mechanisms for deciding value. Um, so keep it small and give a lot of ways for people to decide what's important. Okay. While you're comparing different habitat-like environments, what about the palace? Do you know about the... The what? The palace. The palace. Oh, I'm a big fan of Jim Bumgarner's, or Time Warner's, excuse me. Time Warner's The Palace. Uh, I, I should put a plug in for that. Um, their URL is www.thepalace, one word, dot com. It's a 2D world. It's basically uh, every, world, every screen is a flat picture, unlike Habitat, which every ob the screen was composed of objects and the objects are all live. Uh, the palace is basically a flat picture in which people can be uh, a little icon representing their face. The default is a, a smiley face ball with different expressions, which you can then add things on. Uh, but since you can add any bitmaps you want into this space, um, people just like obliterate the smiley face ball and, and create you know, Bart Simpsons and er Batman. I mean, you should see them. I've got quite a collection myself. In fact, I moved the avatar off that slide of the Descent of Avatars. I have that avatar in the palace. So this is like two, two different worlds colliding in that space. It raises a bunch of interesting issues, though, uh, which I, should, I wanted to bring out since you, you asked. Um, the nature changes. This is different than a mud. This is different than a habitat. And this is different than alpha world. This is different than the rest because you enter a new realm. With user-created bitmaps, you now enter the realm of offensive graphics, copyrighted graphics, people using other people's graphics that they spend a lot of time. So there's this investment capital cost. And you want exposure to that real fast, visit the palace. Uh, it's real easy, Mac, Mac and PC clients, easily download. It's a lot of fun. Little heads, little word balloons appear near the heads. Uh, lots of lessons to learn there. Uh, very dynamic. I'll, I'll be surprised if Time Warner runs that server much longer uh, because uh, Time Warner is a conservative company. And uh, if you guys know about MUDs, you know you can't stay conservative with a mud, running a MUD very long. Uh, I, I wish them the best of luck. Uh, one of the great things is the, the palace, unlike these other things, distributes the server. It's, it's, it's in the MUD tradition, which is you get not only the client, but you get the, the software to run your own server and put it up on the net, which I think is a wonderfully uh, insidious and, and, and wonderful thing. Lots of people will experiment. One thing in terms... Oh, was it, wait, was there a question over there? No? Okay. I'm sorry. One thing it seems like, uh, as you just mentioned, that as you start distributing out the... Uh, the power to the users, you can get into offensive graphic, offensive graphics, uh, behavior, etc. Won't this at some point come cross over the lines of censorship? Sure, sure. It, it, and there's this great trade-off between control and, and freedom, um, and that's part of one of the things EC is really concerned about, and that's why we want to put mechanisms for transportability and policy into the net. One of the things that happens when you go into most MUDs uh, is you don't know how to behave. You can't tell because it says, welcome to spine move, and there you are. And the, you know, there are rules of road. You have to know to type help manners. And it turns out help manners doesn't have all the information you need either. You know, um, That's just in a social space. What happens when the transactions are more significant? Okay, they're professional. Now, I choose to travel most moves in, in my own form. I identify who I am. I transfer myself. I just avoid all that hassle by acting like my professional self. Um, and identifying myself as such. But the policies of when you move from place to place change. When I come run on a server, if there's a MUD running here in Stanford, the policies are different than a MUD running at Time Warner. And yet, I can't tell. And we think those issues are critical as John Q. Public comes into cyberspace. He needs to know what's expected of him. The same kind of exp social expectations we have about things like doorways, that if you're in an office and the door is closed, um, that means you have to knock before you come in. We need to find ways to capture those kinds of protocols, social protocols in cyberspace, because they don't exist. When you create these worlds, literally every single time I see a, a MUD or one of these comes up, everyone in the beta test group models of behavior. They have everything to lose if they get kicked out of the test. They have a status symbol. They're participating in something special. The day of release. 
the internet hordes arrive, some of them apparently under 12 and male, <laughs> and destroy the space. And, and, and much to the surprise of the architects, who thought this was working just fine. So s social constructs are, are inherently in these worlds. More questions? Hi. You started to allude to these issues in your last answer. Um, it seems like most of your experience has been in designing these make-believe fantasy worlds. Um, mm -hmm. What are going to be the issues where I don't want to visit some make-believe place, but I want to visit the real Toys R Us or some lawyer right. or, or some particular Now, Am Amex wasn't make-believe. It was very real. Uh, in fact, the initial markets were in small talk development, programmers working with other programmers, exchanging code and advice and con contracting. Um, and I information, uh, I want to say data miners, um, I'm blocking on the name of the, the people who search databases professionally. Um, and uh, that's a different audience. And that's why you talk about what, the, what are the social constructs. You were right, I was hitting at it. What are the social constructs? When I'm here and I have this persistent identity, this persistent identity represents Randy Farmer, recognized cyberspace researchers that comes with clout and responsibilities. Um, and, and things I say can be quoted and things like that. Um, and at the same time, I want to be over here and I want to, to act like a, a prepubescent 12-year-old for a while in the palace. Uh, how do I do these things? Keep them separate and yet them, let them coexist. And, and that's key to electric communities concerns is that persistent identity um, is one of the many attributes that people want and that people can create multiple of those. Often when people start thinking about these spaces, they think it has to be anonymous or it has to be you know, full, fully disclosed. And it's not true. It's on a per case basis, just like it is in your life. Um, I don't tell everyone who I am everywhere and everything about me, and I shouldn't have to. In some cases, I do. Up there? Uh, we just got one more. In the yeah. Uh, will the uh, Telecom Bill and the Decency Act and all that stuff, will that affect these, these uh, worlds that you've been creating? Um, Yes and no. We're, we believe in proactive um, proactive censorship. Actually, there was a great article on this yesterday. I forgot who wrote it. Um, I believe those people who are supposedly going to be censored by these things don't, wouldn't mind and would prefer a system where they could advertise what they were and only get the customers that they wanted. So whether we're talking about sexually explicit content, uh, Aryan nations, I mean, or things much less controversial like access to uh, rape, ra other rape or incest vi victims. That people want to form communities for communication. And, and there's no way, everyone knows this, right? There's no way on the net you're ever going to prevent it. You can't stamp out the Aryans on the net. You want to stamp out the Aryans on the net, shine a light on it, make an attachment to their page and show them how stupid, you know, show how stupid you think they are. Um, the bills themselves, are problematic, but they're not pro any more problematic than Germany and China are in these regards. The w network's going to be global. People will want restrictive sets for themselves and for others. And the mechanisms will exist to create them one way or another. And just, if we can make them non-onerous you know, non and, and, and properly functional, um, then we can all interact. And we don't end up shutting China off the net, so, right, which I think would be a shame. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.